This is Adam Martin Television. Hello there everyone, and welcome to part 4 of this series looking at the history and impact of Doctor Who ratings. If you haven't seen parts 1, 2 and 3, I highly recommend that you check them out, as we looked at the first three seasons of the show to star William Hartnell as the first Doctor. But now sit back, relax, and join me once again as we delve back into the wonderfully niche world of Doctor Who ratings. Our destination? Season 4. It's the autumn of 1966. Children are returning to school after the summer break, and not only are Saturdays the prime time for families to relax from work, but it's also the day when Doctor Who would return to the tea time slot. From September of 1965 to July of 1966, the show's third season had aired. The ten stories that comprised it were all quite different, despite scathing reviews that suggested otherwise, but after a strong start, the ratings took a sharp decline, going from story average of 9.9 .9 million for the season opener all the way down to a 5.2 million average for the concluding story. The season average came out at around 7.4 million viewers, a weaker figure than both seasons 1 and 2. With season 4 beginning, this heralded the biggest and most notable change in the show yet. With his health really declining and affecting his work, William Hartnell was to leave the part at the end of October. The first two series of season 4 are his, but for the remaining seven adventures, we have a brand new actor leading the show. But more on that when we get there. The prevailing question was at the time, with the change in lead actor, could the show survive? And what would it do to those all-important viewing figures? The first story from season 4 is The Smugglers. The Doctor, Ben and Polly arrive on a windswept Cornish coastline in the 17th century, and get involved in a crooked tale of piracy and smuggling. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 10th of September 1966 and concluded on the 1st of October. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes and ouch, that is not a good way to start things off. No single episode of this story cracked the 5 million mark, which people make a fuss of today, but back in 1966 this would have been a massive red flag, especially as the return of a popular show is meant to bring in big figures. Episode 3 brings in the lowest individual rating in the show's history thus far, clocking in at 4.2 million. The smugglers didn't really have a good chance from the off. Competition on the other side at ITV included popular veterinary soap Weaver's Green, and in many other regions talent show Opportunity Knox. So despite airing in the 5.50pm slot, a time which before had proved a successful point in the day for Doctor Who, not even that could save it from low viewing figures. The smugglers is also a historical story which at this point were really falling out of favour with areas of the public, with some children describing on an edition of Junior Points of View that they were bored with the series. I would say give this story another chance with a rewatch, but unfortunately we can't. You guessed it, just like a lot of the previous season, all four episodes of The Smugglers are currently missing from the BBC archives. Some censor clips, moments cut in overseas prints, do survive, but aside from that, the best way to relive this dive into smuggling for the TARDIS team is either via the Target novelization or as an audio drama. Overall, this story attracted an average of 4.5 million viewers, a terrible new low for the series. This was the first time Doctor Who would average a figure lower than 5 million, and considering this was the penultimate tale to feature William Hartnell, I'm sure some folks at the BBC may have considered it best cancelling the show after he left in the next adventure. Thankfully, that did not happen, and that very last story for Hartnell would prove to be one of the most momentous in the show's long history. Fare ye well, Jamaica. The second story from Season 4 is The Tenth Planet, Antarctica, 1986. The TARDIS team joined forces with members of Snowcap Base in order to prevent the threat of the residents of the planet Mondas, better known as the Cybermen. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 8th of October 1966 and concluded on the 29th of the same month. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and thank goodness we see a great improvement here for William Hartnell's final story. Despite a low start of 5.5 million, by story's end, viewing figures are comfortably well within the 7 million range. Whilst there was still decent competition on ITV, the 10th planet got bolstered up by a few reasons. One is obviously down to the fact that by this point, the public had known that William Hartnell would be stepping down from the role of the Doctor so the boost particularly towards the end of the story could indicate the viewer interest that there was in seeing what would happen and just who would take over. Also, this story had a futuristic theme to it, 
not just in the time period of the then far away 1986, but also with the Cybermen, human-like creatures augmented with electronics and cybernetics. These Mondasian Cybermen, as they came to be known, are still quite chilling to look at and listen to. They may not be as sleek or sophisticated as later Cybermen designs, but the fact they most closely resemble a human being makes it even more of a horrific concept. All episodes still exist today apart from episode 4. However, we still have footage of the iconic closing moment, the first regeneration. William Hartnell faded away, and in his place lay Patrick Troughton, a respected character actor who was now the second Doctor Who. Overall, this story attracted an average of 6.8 million viewers, a huge welcome increase from the smugglers, beating that story's average by over 2 million. This is nowhere near the dizzying heights the show was achieving throughout its second season, but it's a healthy figure nonetheless. The Tenth Planet is still enjoyable today, whether that be as a DVD, a Target book, or as an audio drama. It serves as a blueprint for how the show would be presented in the following few years, introduces one of the most classic recurring villains, and provides a very fitting end to the First Doctor's era. Emotions, love, pride, hate, fear. Have you no emotions, sir? Can't be Let's have a look at the season averages all the way through the William Hartnell years. Season 2 reigns supreme, averaging 10.4 million viewers across its 9 stories. Season 1 comes second, with 8.1 million over 8 stories. And then Season 3, with 7.4 million over 10 stories, and finishing with Season 4, an average of 5.7 million. However, one important factor to take into account regarding Season 4, Hartnell was only the Doctor for two of the nine stories. And although these figures do show that Doctor Who had a great first year, an even better second year, but then the early stages of decline began to set in with Season 3 and continued into Season 4. Just to be super nerdy with numbers for a second, by combining these season averages we can calculate that the average ratings for the Hartnell era of Doctor Who comes in at 7.9 million viewers. That's a pretty healthy average across Hartnell's three years in the role, and shows that even if the show's popularity began to slip in 1966, enough people had watched and fallen in love with the crotchety but kind old man that we only knew as the Doctor. Just go forward in all your beliefs and prove to me that I am not mistaken in mine. The third story from season four is the power of the Daleks. Landing on the planet Vulcan, Ben, Polly and the new Doctor discover that the Daleks are being reactivated, but they seem to be acting as servants? How long will this facade last? This story is comprised of six episodes, which began airing on the 5th of November, 1966, and concluded on the 10th of December. Here are the individual viewing figures for all six episodes. We can see that the numbers are holding nice and firm in the 7 million range, with the peak being episode 5, which just cracked into 8 million. A solid performance for the second Doctor's first story. That would be an incredibly strong reason as to why this story had better ratings compared to the previous two tales of season 4. People wanted to see this new Doctor in action, and just how different he would be to the old man we'd been used to for three years. Also, the Daleks were back. Even though Dalek Mania wasn't what it was a year earlier, they were already cemented as the most popular Doctor Who villain, so pairing them against a new Doctor was a surefire way not just to appeal to long-time fans by bringing back a recurring monster, but also to see if the Daleks could still pack the ratings punch they had done previously. Competition on ITV wasn't impacting as much as it did at the start of the season, but even though ratings were better, reviews were not. A lot of publications, and viewers for that matter, found that they weren't warming to this new Doctor, at least not for now. But with the show recording episodes only two weeks before broadcast, the BBC almost didn't have the time to stop and consider this. They had their new Doctor, and they were going to, in typical British fashion, carry on regardless. Overall, this story attracted an average of 7.8 million viewers, a 1 million increase from the previous story. We've discussed how the new Doctor and the Daleks were sure to draw audience interest, arguably being the biggest reason for this numerical boost, but sadly all six episodes of The Power of the Daleks are missing from the archive. However, this serial was animated and released on DVD. Twice. Yep, it was released in 2016 and then as a special edition with improved animation and extra bonus features in 2020. I would say go for the 2020 version if you already don't own a copy of the story, but you can also enjoy Power as a, a virgin adaptation book, albeit a more expensive one, or as an audio drama, which coincidentally was my very first audio that was Doctor Who related. The fourth story from season four is The Highlanders. The time travellers land in Scotland, 1746, and fall in with some Highlanders during the Battle of Culloden, and also meet a new ally, the headstrong but charming Jamie McCrimmon. 
This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 17th of December 1966 and concluded on the 7th of January 1967. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and we can see things have dipped slightly. The peak of the story comes with episode 3, which sits at 7.4 million viewers, and the lowest being episode 1, which gained an audience of 6.7 million. These are still decent figures for a show in 1967, and there are several potential reasons for the drop in the previous story. One being that The Highlanders is a historical, and by this point these kinds of stories weren't enjoyed by many viewers of the audience, and the reaction to this story in fact prompted those who ran the show at the time to abandon purely historical affairs for more futuristic, monster-based stories. Also, some ITV regions were showing Batman. Yes, that Batman. The Highlanders is most remembered nowadays for being the introduction of Fraser Hines as Jamie McCrimmon, and the Scottish character would end up being aboard the TARDIS crew for the rest of the Second Doctor's era, becoming one of the longest serving companions ever. Unfortunately, like Power of the Daleks before it, no episode of The Highlanders still exists in the BBC archives. It's the usual methods if you want to enjoy this story today, so either a target novelisation or an audio drama. Overall, this story attracted an average of 7.1 million viewers, a steady drop from the previous story, but still a decent average in retrospect. As 1967 rolled in with the conclusion of this story, it was also meaning the end of the purely historical stories for a very, very long time. But as less trips into the past were to occur, that did mean we were going to see monsters. A lot of monsters. Doctor, can we take him with us? If he teaches me to play the bagpipes. If you want, Doctor. Oh, that's all we need. Come, Come on, Jamie. On. But where are we going? You'll see. The fifth story from season four is The Underwater Menace. In the legendary city of Atlantis, the insane Professor Zaroff plans to drain the world's oceans for his own evil schemes, and nothing in the world can stop him now. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 14th of January 1967 and concluded on the 4th of February. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes. Ratings seem to be holding steady as the Troughton era progresses. All episodes gained over 7 million viewers, with episode 1 being the peak with 8.3 million. So is it fair to say at this point that audiences were now settling with the second Doctor? Well, you would think that looking at the numbers, but if you look at the many reviews from the time, people still weren't really enjoying Troughton's performance. ITV in some regions was still showing the ever-popular Batman, but I have my own theory. Those who tuned into Power of the Daleks to see the new Doctor really enjoyed what they saw, and maybe they preferred this more clownish fellow to the brasher Sterner Hartnell, thus tuning in every week to a show they felt they could now connect with. That's just a theory after all, but at least Doctor Who was gaining ratings that were considered good within the TV world. The Underwater Menace may not be the most memorable story ever, but it serves as the earliest example we can see of a Trout story in its original form. As for years, only episode 3 survived in the BBC archives, and episode 2 was then found and returned in 2011. Overall, this story attracted an average of 7.5 million viewers. This is a small improvement from the Highlanders, but still not rising above the 7.8 million average set by Power of the Daleks. However, saying that, again, a 7.5 million average in 1967 is more than respectable. To enjoy The Underwater Menace today, there's the Target book, the audio release, and a DVD release. Although keep in mind, this only contains episodes 2 and 3 as they were filmed with episodes 1 and 4 being reconstructed via telesnaps. There's always rumours that another DVD release will come with the missing episodes being animated, and it may well happen, but time will tell. Always does. Nothing in the world can stop me now! The sixth story from season 4 is the Moonbase. The year is 2070 and Earth's weather is controlled by a station on the moon. The Doctor and his friends arrive initially under suspicion from the crew, but once the Cybermen arrive, they must work together to save the Earth, and to survive. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 11th of February 1967 and concluded on the 4th of March. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and this looks much better. Every episode gains over 8 million viewers, with episode 2 being the peak, reaching 8.9 million and the main driving force behind this increase could be placed down to promotion. The producer of Doctor Who at the time, Innes Lloyd, pulled all the strings he could to really deliver a good promotional run for the Moonbase, including a special trailer, which weren't as common as they are on TV today, extensive coverage in the Radio Times, and the story's author, Kit Pedler, being featured in many interviews. The Cybermen had been redesigned for their return, and their reappearance was also being used as a factor to pull audiences back in. I'm glad they did promote this story a lot because it truly is a beauty. 
A nice tight base under siege tale in four parts, the Cybermen redesign looks great, and they still remain a chilling foe for the Doctor to face. The story was released on DVD in 2014, although episodes 1 and 3 are currently missing, so these are presented via animation. There is also the Target book, retitled to Doctor Who and the Cybermen, and an audio release. Overall, this story attracted an average of 8.3 million viewers, the highest average of the season so far, and the highest average since The Celestial Toymaker, which also gained the same figure. With the success of the Cybermen now established, it wouldn't be long before the cyborgs would be back on viewers' TV screens, the BBC hoping that they would reach or maybe even eclipse the popularity of the Daleks, who were looking to be moved away from Doctor Who by their creator and owner, Terry Nation. But with ratings at a new high with the Moonbase and the next few stories promising new monsters, surely things were only going to keep going up, right? There are some corners of the universe which have read the most terrible things. Things which act against everything that we believe in. They must be fought. The seventh story from Season 4 is the Macro Terror. In the midst of a human colony, the TARDIS crew discover along with its inhabitants that the colony has been infiltrated by the giant crab-like Macra. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 11th of March 1967 and concluded on the 1st of April. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and despite an ever so slight drop from the moon base, we can see that ratings are holding pretty firm. Three out of the four episodes passed the 8 million mark, with episode 2 being the only exception, just missing out by gaining 7.9 million. Though keep in mind, these are still very respectable figures in late 60s television. The macro were touted in promotional material to be a truly sinister threat, and indeed the concept had legs to develop into an instantly classic monster for the series. However, the combination of the rather cumbersome macro prop, along with it being barely viewable or even convincing in the final story, led to it being a monster that for many years was seen as a bit of a joke. The macro wouldn't be seen in the show for another 40 years, finally returning in the 2007 story, Gridlock. If you were first introduced to the macro through this 10th Doctor story and want to see how they got their start, you have a few options. You have the usual suspects, you know, target novelization, audio release, but you also have the animated reconstruction available on DVD and Blu-ray. All four episodes are currently missing from the archives bar a few clips, so the animated reconstruction is your best bet for trying to experience the tale in full, both in terms of audio and visuals. Overall, this story attracted an average of 8.2 million viewers, a very small drop from the moon base indeed. I think these figures show that the now shifted focus to stories more centred around futuristic settings and menacing monsters was working in terms of gaining the interest of the viewing public, but also entertaining them in such a way that they kept returning week after week. Sure, we still aren't seeing 10 million plus figures like we did a few seasons ago, but 8 million averages showed that early in Patrick Troughton's time as the Doctor, people were watching, and as the weeks went on, they began to enjoy and take into his Doctor. There's another one! <laughs> The eighth and penultimate story of Season 4 is The Faceless Ones. After a shaky landing at London Gatwick Airport, the Doctor discovers the deadly chameleons luring young holiday-goers to their orbiting satellite, in order to have them possessed for their own ends. This story is comprised of six episodes, which began airing on the 8th of April 1967 and concluded on the 13th of May. Here are the individual viewing figures for all six episodes, and we seem to be a bit all over the place here. The story's opening and closing episode both attain the peak viewership, with 8 million viewers. Episode 2 has the lowest ratings at 6.4 million, and the remaining episodes all hover just under or over the 7 million mark, and episode 3 almost claws at 8 million, but falling just short and finishing with 7.9 million. The big dips in this story ratings-wise is an oddity, really. All six episodes went out at the normal 5.50pm time slot, and competition on ITV was also consistent. Maybe the additions of their programs, such as Doddy's Magic Box, Batman and Just Jimmy, were just really good instalments part way across the six weeks that The Faceless Ones was broadcast in. The story itself sees the departure of companions Ben and Polly, after it's revealed that this story takes place on exactly the same day as their debut, The War Machines. We can't see this departure in its original form, however, as only episodes 1 and 3 of this story exist in the BBC archive. These surviving episodes, alongside all surviving episodes for this season, can be found on the Lost in Time DVD box set. Or if you want to enjoy The Faceless Ones in full, you have the Target novel, the audio release, and the story was animated in full and released on DVD and Blu-ray in 2020. Overall, this story attracted an average of 7.4 million viewers. 
Now this is almost a million drop from the previous story, but there is a few things to take note. One being that the lower viewing figures for episode 2 and 4 dragged the story's average down considerably from what it could have been had all the episodes had similar ratings. Secondly, as this was a six part story as opposed to a four part one, it has a longer time to try and keep audiences hooked, as if people jumped off part way through, there is more chance more would hop off if the story doesn't captivate them. However, the Faceless Ones continues the trend of having either a present day or futuristic setting, with evil aliens being the source of the problem, and the story's conclusion would lead right into the events of the season's finale. The ninth and final story from Season 4 is The Evil of the Daleks. The TARDIS has gone missing, and the Doctor and Jamie discover that the Daleks are behind it. With new companion Victoria, can they defeat the Daleks, prevent them from using the human factor to turn them into unstoppable creatures, and escape the wrath of a full-blown civil war? This story is comprised of seven episodes, which began airing on the 20th of May 1967, and concluded on the 1st of July. Here are the individual viewing figures for all seven episodes, and oh, for a Dalek story, these figures are far from the best. Episode 1 kicks things off strongly with 8.1 million viewers tuning in, but from there everything drops, the lowest point being episode 5 with only 5.1 million viewers, a 3 million drop from the opener. So for a season finale and a Dalek story at that, what on earth happened? Well, the time slots across the seven episodes are a bit all over too. Episode 1 aired at 6pm due to FA Cup coverage, Episode 7 went out at 6.25 due to Wimbledon coverage, and all the remaining episodes going out at the usual 5.50pm slot. In the past, time slot shifts have affected Doctor Who's ratings, but the 6pm showing of Episode 1 gained the highest figures for the story, so that point is arguably moot. In terms of competition, depending on what region you lived in, you had the option of either ITV's selection of talent shows, comedies, or American imports. Also, Evil of the Daleks broadcast into the summer months, a typical time for audience figures to drop across all television. Finally, despite the extensive promotion for this story, due to the Daleks appearing once again, I think by this point, summer of 1967, Dalek mania had well and truly ended. The Pepper Pots were still popular, but they no longer commanded the pull they once had only a few years prior. Audiences could have easily been tired of seeing the Daleks yet again in just under six months from their last appearance. But in any case, season four of Doctor Who ended with a new companion, Deborah Watling's Victoria, aboard the TARDIS, and the Daleks facing their final end. Overall, this story attracted an average of 6.4 million viewers, a million drop from the previous story and the lowest average rating for a Dalek story thus far. It is a real shame that what could have well been the last Dalek story at that time had the lowest viewership of any of their appearances. But for what it's worth, Evil of the Daleks is a contender for not just one of the best Dalek stories of the 60s, but one of the best Dalek stories in all of Classic Who. Episode 2 is the only surviving episode in the archives, and you can see that on the Lost in Time box set. There is an expensive novelization of this story available, and also an audio release. An animated reconstruction is heavily rumored to be released sometime in 2021. You will help the Daleks test another human being! What sort of test? Do not question! I will not be your slave! Doctor, I beg you! Now before we round things off for this season, we actually have some repeat viewing figures for you. The Evil of the Daleks has the rare distinction of being one of the few stories from the 60s era of Doctor Who to get a repeat during the 60s itself. At the end of Season 5's finale, The Wheel in Space, the Doctor is preparing to tell new companion Zoe a tale involving the dreaded Daleks, just so she knows what she's in for when they go aboard the TARDIS. This then led into a full repeat of Evil over the next seven Saturdays, perfectly filling the seven week gap between the end of Season 5 and the start of Season 6. Here is the individual viewing figures and the average ratings for the repeat, that began airing on the 8th of June and concluded on the 3rd of August of 1968. We see the repeat figures are fairly stable, despite a drop to 4.2 million with episode 6, and an average of 5.3 million over a million drop from its original broadcast run. Have you ever heard of the Daleks? No. Then watch. So that's season 4 the nine stories that comprise it, and the ratings that they garnered. With the transmission of Episode 7 of The Evil of the Daleks on the 1st of July 1967, Season 4 of Doctor Who was brought to an end. The season ran for just under 10 months, and was made up of 43 episodes across nine stories. The fact that they recorded most of this season's episode either only a week or two weeks before their transmission, and still delivered some cracking stories to us is honestly quite remarkable. 
Let's have a look at the story averages for this season, from the point where Patrick Troughton took over. We can see that the highest story average was with the Moonbase, standing at 8.3 million. The lowest point came with the finale, The Evil of the Daleks, which came in at 6.4 million viewers who tuned in to see the Doctor's supposed final battle with the Sinister Pepper Pots. Looking at the numbers across the second Doctor's first set of stories, it's positive to see that for the most part everything looks moderately healthy. I'm sure the BBC hoped and wanted the show to once again reach the 10 million plus viewers with all the shake-ups and changes the show was having, but sadly those heights would have to wait until later down the line. But one thing was for certain, the new Doctor was here to stay and the TARDIS team were going to face more monsters, many, many more monsters in the next few seasons to come. If we work out the average amount of viewers across the entire season, we can calculate that the average for Season 4 of Doctor Who is around roughly 7.5 million viewers, which is a very slight increase from the average of the previous season. Now this figure only takes into account the stories featuring Patrick Troughton as the Doctor. If we include the two Hartnell tales for a moment, the average decreases to 7.1 million viewers, a lower figure than Season 3. And this is undoubtedly due to the low ratings of the Smugglers. But for Patrick Troughton's first run of stories to technically be slightly more successful audience-wise than Hartnell's final full season, if anything, it showed that the changes in the show's direction to less historical and more science fantasy-based adventures was working. And this is the motif the production team would continue with for the rest of the 1960s. So those are the ratings details for Season 4. I hope you enjoyed this numerical look back at the year of change as it were. A brand new Doctor could have easily spelled disaster for the show, but as we know, thankfully, that never came to pass. If you want to learn more information about what the Daleks were up to throughout the 1960s, I highly recommend you check out Dalek 6388 here on YouTube, as they make excellent in-depth documentaries regarding the original Dalek props. If you want to read more about Doctor Who and the making of it, I highly recommend the complete history series of books, which I used as reference for this video. Please consider leaving a like, subscribing to the channel, and leaving your thoughts on Season 4 in the comments section below. I've been Adam Martin from AMTV, and we will see you next time for Season 5. A massive thank you to our producer and director patrons for your support towards us here at AMTV. You just help keep us going, and that's massively appreciated. And that does bring us to the end of another evening here on AMTV. We hope you enjoyed the programme, and we hope to see you next time. Good night.